Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the famous Blue Note Jazz Club here in New York City. Blessing the band stage for two unprecedented sold out nights is Grammy nominated Jimbez Weedy Brima. Now, Weedy hails from West Africa by way of Ghana, but he was raised in East St. Louis, Missouri. Now what's very interesting about this gentleman is that in 2021, Time Magazine rated his album, The Hands of Time, which was nominated for a Grammy, as the number seven album of top albums of 2021. And above that, which was number six, was Donda by the great Kanye West. Now, the djembe is very interesting because it's drumming, but he's also bringing a very unique voice to an instrument that's extinctly African, but also he fuses his African roots with jazz, funk, and hip hop. Thank you. 
Hey, uh, you've had a hell of a two years, man. I want to congratulate you one Grammy nine. Um, another thing I want to congratulate you on is this album was rated number seven on Time Magazine's best album of 2021. <laughs> and, and, and this is just amazing because we don't see that. In an era where Donda was above me, above me. that speaks volumes. As a djembe player, bro. As a djembe follower. That's, for me, I'm, that was a testament to saying that it's possible. I'm not saying I'm the baddest mother, like, I'm that dude or anything like that, but it's possible that someone that took that instrument made of goat skin and wood and let it be its passport to the universe and it made a door for me to open that I can never turn back and close. It's open forever. And, and for the, every Jimbe Fola and Kungero that want, will do this, that are doing it, can say it's possible. They don't have to just play for um, a dance class or be in a dance company or just be in a band. They can follow their mission and, and use that voice that they're using to create their own path and their own road. Because I realized, I talked to a friend of mine the other day. We don't realize how many people in my, in my world, in this world, use this instrument as a job or as a way to, be, to make a living and to use this as their passion to go. This is like second or third thing in their life. They got their work, they got their family, and then they'll probably play drums. Or they got their family, they got this job, that job, and if I have time, did I go play? So for me to do this full out, and for that to happen, it's, I can't do nothing but thank God, man. The music on this album is really an autobiography of where you started and where you're getting ready to go. And you also pay a lot of respect to the ancestors. Mm. Your father's spoken word, mm -hmm. um, you got Ola Tuji. Well, we got we gonna go in that in a oh second. Oh Lord! I I mean, he's Kamadi Denizu. Yes, and I was just gonna say, you know, those guys pass the baton to you now, and you're running with it, and that's gotta be a lot of weight on your shoulders right now. Let me tell you something, man. I picked those three names for one important reason. Those three people that began that song on Full Circle. Yeah were my heroes. Ola Tunji was the first musician I saw on David Letterman playing the three drums. I remember that. You remember that? I remember that. First drummer. Kimani was the first musician that was on Reading Rainbow. Really? LeVar Burton. There was a whole, if you can look this up, there was a whole program dedicated to the drum, Africa, African drum making, the instrumentation of drums and dancing. Forces of Nature perform. I forgot the brother who carved the drum and Kamadi showed how to play these drums and these instruments. Wow. To up the barbarian. And that this was like, that was one of my things I had on my VCR and my video where I had Ola Tunji show that and a video of my dad. On that video with my dad, he was my hero. Nobody could outright him, nobody could do anything. So he was the one that was like, that's it. That's why that words he said, Luko Nana, why did they do that? That's on his first album he did in America. He named that to my sister called Jimmy Latu. Hmm. So those three things were the things that, those voices were very important for me in my history of going to where I was trying to go. That's why I choose it at this like Olatunji. It was all his story in timeline where I was correct. Olatunji. Kimani did Zulu and did my dad. You know, music soothes the savage beast. And I I know why everyone loves this record. And they're gonna see it in this piece, man. Just how the music is a reflection. You've got a little mini UN on that band stage. Oh yeah. And you do native African rhythms, mm -hmm. you do funk. You do R and B. You do you do a little bit of everything, and people can identify with what you're trying to do. Well, I was trying to find a way to 
bring what I heard in my house. My, I grew up in a house of straight ahead, a Ghanaian composer who was mixing straight ahead with high life and and not well, not Afrobeat, but high life, Ghanaian music, big band Ghanaian music, along with funk, cause those, and then the New Orleans connection with my grandfather. So if you get all those in, I had to find a way to implement that, that story into my life. I had to find a way to bring that. So through, and throughout my years of being on this earth, I've seen, uh, I've been able to work with people who when I heard the music, I knew what I've always wanted to do when I heard that music, that, that, that rock you hear when you hear funk, or the rock you hear when you hear rumba, or the rock you hear you, when you hear ting a ling a ling I wanted to find a way to connect the voices. And some people say, well, you don't want to do that and it's not possible. Because you either have to be real versed in one to try to be like, okay, I'm gonna mix this rhythm with this rhythm and now we got this fusion. Mm -hmm. Not how it goes. You have to be able to speak every language to combine the narratives. And everybody on that stage have been, we've played with bands, whether it was straight ahead, funk, traditional, um, Bamana, Wasilusta, Balak. Now all those people that played those styles, they also had to make money as a musician in America. So it's not like, all right, yeah, I can't just play in Balak all day. So let me go do this gig with this funk band. It pays good, I can play that shit. Or I, not like I play straight ahead. I'm gonna make money playing this, but I will try to bring my world into this. All these musicians can speak any voice in vernacular in this style of music, but they also know how to marry the web, the worlds together. Right. Not that many people can marry a style of music to create a sound. That's the difference. That's the saying like saying, okay, I'm gonna blend this with that, and we need to change the game. No. When people say that with me, I laugh. Because when they say, yeah, we playing the African stuff with the jazz, I'm like, okay. Christian, the reason why my brother Zion, Atunde Ajwa, is amazing, because he took the time to sit with me, and we went over traditional rhythms. He took the time to research. It's funny, now we go on the road, and he get the sand stuff. I say, where the hell you learn that? Because he's researching. And from our conversations, he'll go back from those conversations and really pull a lot of in-depth stuff out. And I, I'm, I'm amazed because he's an ethnomusicologist, but he's also a person that studies folklore indigenously in its purest form, like how I live. So we would have conversations for hours and hours and hours and hours. And then we would get together to create something that would bring those narratives. And not like we were going to put straight ahead with this and that's happening. You, people try that. It's flopped. But the reason why Ancestral Recall was special because we brought our minds together. You know what I'm saying? And not just from a, we brought those worlds together. So I, cause I knew how to play with a straight ahead band of the vernacular. I knew how to play stretch music. So I was able to, we were, we were able to create those voices. Now with this album, I knew the people in my band that could speak any narrative. And if I was to say, we're going to play this, we're going to play Sunu. But we're gonna change the, the emotion. Good example. There's a song on the album called Express Train to Bamako. You recognize this song? Yeah. The song Express Train to Bamako is very unique because the story is a play on word Express Train to Bamako. So you can take the Express Train to Bamako from Dakar, but you can express train, T R A N E, to Bamako. How would train feel in Bamako? Right. Express train, express train, or express train to Bamako. So if you listen to the rhythm, we always talk about giant steps. It's flipped. The first bar is what it is. To get getting, 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 right. getting, getting, and it changes. But the styling of the, the, the that the guitarist Sam Dickey is playing is bajaru, bajaru sounding that comes from straight Mandin culture, Jeliya culture. So you play this bajaru style. But to play that inside of that melody, inside of that piece, and that 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 frame of work, you won't find nobody can do that. I've not, I not. I bear witness, no one has done it, and probably no one ever will. And the reason being because when you go to school learning how to play this jazz music, but you go to West Africa and study this music, and you find a way to marry the worlds, not just by playing a song on top of another song, but creating a narrative together. 
then you have to surround yourself with those people who can do that. Like I said before, you show me who your friends are, I'll show you who you are. And if I can get musicians who can speak like that, then I've made my way. And everybody in this band is able to do that. Synopsis of the origin yeah. of the instrument. Jimbe. The word Jimbe started off as Jimbimba. From the so when you go to an ethnic group, there's an ethnic group in West Africa called Mandang. 
The Mandane people live in countries that are called Mali, Guinea, Senegal, Sierra Leone, the Gambia, uh, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, Guinea. So if I was to put a djembe within West Africa, everything that's inside that djembe is Mandane territory. Now mind you, we're talking about pre-colonialism, so there was no borders, only ethnic groups. Right. So during the time of the great King Sunjata Keita, once he became Mansa king, he created his own form of government where some of his people start to migrate to other countries. When they left, they also took Manding with them. Now during that time, it was the djembe that became one of the very popular instruments that was known. Outside, because everything that has a caste system, every drum, every ethnic group, or everybody in Manding has a caste system. And how do you know a caste system? By your last name. So, the djembe folas, the caste system that walks with them are the blacksmiths or the numus who are the creators of the instrument. The original name of Jimbe is Jimbe Bara, also known as Ankaji Ankabe. So if you ever hear the word Jimbe Bara, that person is old, old school, and he understands the history of the instrument. Jimbe Bara, also known as Ankaji Ankabe, which simply means in Mandane or in Bavanakan, everybody in unity and peace, circle of peace. And the person that gave the Numu this instrument was told to me, women, Every song that you start off in traditional African folklore start off with what? Women singing, women clapping before the music even started. Right. The songs are depicted and created by the women. And one thing that you've also explained, and I've watched and read a lot of your interviews, this instrument is all about the melody. And the most important thing that you are going to carry to your grave is the fact that the instrument is all about the melody. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right, let me, let me, let me read that. One of the most important things that I've noticed that you have talked about is that this instrument is all about the melody. And this is really about all African instruments. Absolutely. Uh, and we, then we're talking about drums. There's no way you cannot implement melody with drums. If you don't, you don't know the instrument because the drum is a, as a speaking instrument. We have to play to speak to people. We got to play to speak to the unseen world. We got to play to speak to people to hear them. All this, we're not just drumming. So everything we do is a vocal effect. Right. It's a vocal effect. If I want to say good morning or play certain phrases for the people, I have to know how to play it. If I want to play for the unseen to bring them down and ask them to come, I must know how to play it. If I want to talk about the world to of you, I have to know how to play it. So it's not like we just up there playing just because we feel good. That's why I tell a lot of cats in the West. I say, yo, a lot of my cats with my brothers here, I was like, yo, y'all sound amazing. But the thing is, in order for you guys to know what you just really study, learn how to speak. One thing that's very deep with the old drummers from the Art Blakey's, they would get in tune with the people like Chief Bay. They was getting in tune with older tunes because they were saying, now this some other stuff. Right. It's no longer just us going to the ether, but we knew how to get to the ether and we knew how to bring the ether down. A lot of cats go there by just playing and, and when you ask them, I, they say, I do my spiritual work. I, I, they, but what kind of spiritual work do you do? There's a difference from saying I do and it's a difference from saying that this is what I was doing to be initiated, to work for this, to play for this, to order to bring spirit down. That's why I tell a lot of drummers, I say, if we play together, you're going to feel it. And not because you're going to feel it because I'm trying to battle you or you're trying to battle me. It's that my place or where I'm playing from, it's like in the Karate Kid. You remember, I always say this scene. You remember the scene on the Karate Kid number uh, two when he was in, I think, Korea and he was about to, when Daniel son was about to, fight science and Mr. Miyagi say this is not for point this is for real, real. yes for real that's the difference for me playing with people I said this is not for a point you will cry if we really go somewhere you gonna you will kiss the bumps you might run off the drums because for me to be initiated when we play for folklore drummers we're not just no longer just playing for a gig because we're playing for a naming ceremony we're playing for a spiritual ceremonies we're playing for healing ceremony, all these type of things, when we're able to play this music and then cross over to praise music in a modern text for people who may not understand what we're doing, when we're playing, those people that's hearing this are gonna feel it. But you don't know what you're feeling. Are you feeling something that's gonna change you? Are you feeling something that's gonna lift you? Or you wanna pray or hug somebody? 
All of this is a part of that. So, when you be talking about the word Jimmy, you're talking about the unification of a group of people bringing peace and happiness to everyone around them. The tranquil state. Yeah. Does that fact I'm going to name this piece Unification through the Jimbe. Abana. That means finish. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>
and by people who were spiritually well versed. If you listen to this album, everybody on this album is some form of empath to the right. traditional. I world. noticed that. From Christian, from Corey, from Trombone Shorty, from Tank, from Pedrito, all these people have some form of way that they connect, but let alone the band members. The Junior's heavy too. But he's but we come from that same yeah. world where we play for spirit. We initially play for spirit. We don't just play for drums just to play. So when you when you when you say and when you you say this album was touching, my main goal was to put spirit in the album and not spirit from the album because oh I know something spiritual about it or I just went deeper prayer. No, it's something in here that deals with something listen, else. Listen, when I heard this, I was like, this is Earth, Wind, and Fire. Mm. This is Curtis Mayfield. This is Public Enemy. This is I'll be fifty in June, so this is. 50 years of music that impacted me and not only impacted me, changed my life. And I think this record and what people are going to see is going to change many. One, how they view themselves and two, how do we listen to this music again? Through this, not me, Jimbe. And I wanted it to be known that the instrument, the Jimbe did it. The Jimbe did it. The Jimbe did it. And that's something, at the end of the day, for me, I don't need the Grammy, I don't need nothing. The Jimbe got me into the door. The Jimbe got the band in the door. The Jimbe said it will happen and it will come. The Jimbe did it. The Jimbe did that. That's some intense. To say that an instrument that was never, that wasn't allowed to be played in this country, got something to open up to see that the people can see that it's possible. You, we were the nigger of the industry. The last one hired and the first, first one, one fired. Fire. Bill Summers told me that. So you dealing with people who I'm playing for them. I made this album for the people who were able to play this in a realm that was only codified by the folkloric world, but not in the world's eye. Yeah, it was in the jazz world, but he was the percussionist. But I don't want that. What's the difference from being a Jimmy Fuller as a leader changing the game than a person that's on the sideline say, yeah, I'm doing it. Yeah, we're gonna give him a let we're gonna let uh, brother J Bo give him a little taste. Go ahead and get you some. Ooh, he was killing on them bongos. So fucking Jimbe. The vernacular of how we hear something and how we speak it has to change. His bongo genie. It was a play on word words. This the other day, uh, one of my little brothers said, man, I really had to listen to the damn thing. I'm on the app. I had to really listen to it and realize how wild that was. And I thought about it. I laughed because a lot of times when they hear it, they hear the joke of the accent of how I'm acting. But when you hear what I'm speaking, then it takes the listener back to be like, damn, that was me. I did say that about the instrument. I did think that. I did find myself doing that. So that's how the narrative changes. Once you put yourself and isolate yourself to say, I did this. The next thing is, how do you change it? Do you just start listening to everything African and start to change the way you views and you speak? And, no. You find a way to educate yourself. You go and you research. That's how you what do the it. hell is a djembe? Why is it this? And why is it playing? And why is he doing that? Then you start researching who I played with and what the instrument was doing with their projects. Cause every album I did, I wasn't the guy that's playing the beep beep bop. No, 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 bro. You, you. I speak or spoke with the instrument in different ways, you know. And I'm not turning this to a me thing. I'm just saying what the instrument. I'm nothing but a conduit of the instrument. It did it, not me. Ah!
I told you downstairs, man, this is the calm before the storm, man. And uh, tonight, man, you know, I, you, you got some stiff competition. But you guys are like brothers on that band stage. Yeah, man, I mean, I think I know him. <laughs> I know him. <laughs> really, I mean, I mean, it, tell me how you brought him into this mix. Well, before that, let's talk about how we met. Yeah, let's do yeah. that. We can't, you can't, we can't go in the middle story with us. We start at the beginning, like <laughs> the beginning of time. That wasn't no pun intended. <laughs> but, no, we actually met. Someone actually brought us together. It was uh, yeah. projects we was doing. I was working with a band called The Nth Power a very long time, yeah. Nikki Glassby. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, at that time, was you on tour with The Rescue? You know, you was playing with No, I was in with The Almond Brothers and Ended. Exactly. And, uh, it just ended. and it was in between Almond Brothers and Dead and Dead Company. Dead was a, Company. a year. And I was just hustling. I kept coming to New Orleans yeah. and playing. I was actually staying with Johnny and Deb Vidakovich mm -hmm. and playing the mate, doing all the after show things which I had never been a part of. And I, and I ran into uh, Deitch, mm -hmm. Adam Deitch, mm -hmm. and he had told me before, he was like, you got to meet this cat we need to bring. He told me about the 111th generation and then I was like, oh dude, I'm ready. And then he was like, it's happening right now. He's like, we're just here. I was like, oh. And then we hadn't even played together at that point, you know, and it was, man. The first time we played together was Bear Creek. Yeah. It was me, you, Bernard Purdy, Nigel, and Rosa Vercalia. That's, <laughs> wow. That's how did y'all, how did y'all feel playing with, with Pretty Purdy? Well, that's our man. I mean, you don't get no prettier and <laughs> can, than yeah. How can you, how else can you feel but uh, as, the good, as good as possible? <laughs> and, but, but then. When we met, when we started talking, we had so many things in common musically and this historically. Then we had a person that we knew in common. Yeah. said, man, I used to play at, um, in D.C. back with Kojo Baden. I'm like, that's a legend in this culture in America, dealing with folkloric African drumming in America. Yeah. And he's a part of that, the historic time where these drums were very new in this country. We're only like 60 years young of these instruments in America. And yeah. he's a part of that pedagogy of artists who created that sound in America on the folklore tip, on the folklore African music tip. And he, and he studied with that gentleman. I mean, and that blew my mind that you know I'm not, it shouldn't have, but you know, <laughs> I just was so freaked out. Me and Kojo have the same birthday. I got a picture, I'm gonna find it. You gotta see it. I think I posted it on my Instagram at some point. Mm -hmm. But we had a birthday, a traditional, like Ghanaian mm -hmm. birthday celebration in Anacostia Park in Southeast Washington because mm -hmm. we have the same birthday and they had this wooden stool and it was just like I remember it so clear it's one of my clear childhood memories and those and playing drums and the dances they taught us the dances and what the dances mean and the beats mean mm -hmm. And he was like, I know Kojo, and I was just Kojo like, oh, man, my oh, no. brain just exploded. <laughs> so we, that's such an old connection for me back to seven years old, you know? Wow. And yeah. then, years later, I was on tour with a gentleman named Jonathan Scales, and I got a text. Mm -hmm. And while I got a text, I got a text with a gentleman that says, hey man, I got a new project, and I got to have you a part of it. Hotel and Friends. And for numerous years, I toured with this gentleman yeah. right. project. And I said to myself, one day, he called me some. I'm gonna return the favor. I pray that he could do it. Mm -hmm. So I have created my new project. We just dropped the album, and I was like, you know, I want to come back to the blue note, but I want to do something different. And with being different, I want somebody who will be able to be musical but warm. Have this has got to be important. But this music, you got to be able to be spiritual. You got to be able to be emotionally and mentally and, and spiritually warm to play it. Yeah. It's not music that you play because you're a shredder. You can just play your your, your butt off. So I said, well, who could do it? <laughs> and you know, it's funny you say this, sweetie. It's come full circle. Absolutely. The pendulum has come full circle. And more like brothers. When I saw you guys at Soundcheck, you guys are like more than brothers. It's like you guys read each other's minds musically. And also, music is so improvisational at the same time. So tonight, people are going to see something completely different. Than what they saw, saw last night. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And yesterday was 
an emotional trip. Yeah, it was. For I me mean, too, man. It, we both. It was a. It was an emotional trip. Yeah. So yesterday was. For now, it was an understatement. It was beyond that. Today is going to be the same thing, and what's to come will be the same thing. Because I don't want to look at it like, oh man, this was great, man. You know, thank you. And then years go by and say, oh, you remember when you did that? No. Yeah. I pray, God willing, that this will become a staple yeah. and a beginning voice to continuously be a part of the continuum right. of what music has to present. Because the, the sound of what I'm trying to do with this music is not what you're going to hear. The visual look yeah. of it is not what you're going to see. The sound and what I'm conveying to the people, the only people that get it are the people that are already conveying that words. Otil, my brother, uh, Christian Scott, or Tunde Azra, um, I know the people who are trying to convey that love, that importance of spirituality within love, that continuum of talking about the importance of folkloric identity in this Western music. Those type of things and those type of people have to be in your circle because there's an old saying, you show me who your circle, I'll show you who you are. Yeah, it's mm. true. That's true. That's true. That's true.
you're your mother and I have to we have to pay respect to the elders as always um, Idris Muhammad is 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 your, your yeah. great uncle so <laughs> we got we can talk about the elders we got to start with his teacher Nathaniel Weedy Mars Weedy played with everybody now this is your uncle that's your grandfather that's his brother. New Orleans Weedy is is Leo Morris' eldest brother, Idris Muhammad. Leo was the baby out of 10. Weedy was the eldest and the first drummer to be in Singlet Magdalene, for Swingling the drummer. He was the first endorsee from New Orleans. His best friend was a man named um, Earl Palmer. Earl, Earl and Weedy was like this. The Wrecking Crew. The Wrecking Crew. And Earl said it out of his mouth when I was a little boy. I told my daddy this. I owe Ann a debt. I owe her daddy a debt. So whatever she needs, I have to do. And my daddy wanted, because he was working as the, um, he was over the union in L.A. And so he kept saying, Ann, come back to L.A. And bring that motherfucker with you. He's talking about my daddy. Because my daddy wanted to go there and show his music so he can get some, like, some, some writing for, for, for movies. And he's like, look. All right, that's this shit's killing, but I gotta do this for Ann first. So whatever Ann I can do for Ann, I'ma listen to your music. And cause his ego was like, nah, I will go back to Champagne. We will go. And he begged my mama, don't leave, don't leave. And my mama said something deep. She says, if I don't leave, we really won't be what he's supposed to be. So she left. We left Oakland. We left L.A. And I came back to Champagne. This is after we came back from my cry. And. I remember my mother telling me, she said, your daddy didn't, didn't want to stay there. And Earl didn't want us to leave. He said, Ann, you can stay here, you're going to be one of the greatest. So, Earl Palmer would always talk about my granddaddy. He said, Weedy was one of the baddest cats, he says, in New Orleans. Even Cyril Neville. Cyril Neville was, was talking wow. about, Zigaboo was talking about, well, your granddaddy? And then Illinois Jacket. Um, the Big Bang Hammond, uh, uh, um, uh, Jackie Davis on the Big Bang Hammond, he's drumming it, that's him on the album. So, Weedy, my namesake, was the one that taught Leo, Idris Muhammad. And the reason why, <laughs> my, my uncle, he said, you know, I owe your granddaddy everything, because he told me I wasn't shit to this dying day. He said, my left hand was weak, so therefore, if you ever see him, if you ever watch videos of, of Idris, Watch what stick he plays with his left. He never used a, a, a thin stick. He always used a larger stick and a thinner stick with his right because he said, your granddaddy always told me to get my left hand stronger. So he went to Beyond Board, the tennis player, and got him some tape. And he used that for, for the rest of his life. He said, because Weedy told me to do that because I can't get calluses on my fingers when I start playing straight ahead. On the funk, I was good. He said, but when I start playing, he said, I'll tip. He would be trash, he said that. He said, but Weedy was the reason why I started playing funk because I was scared of jazz. And my mommy, his grandma, my grandma, my great grandmother, told him to come wash clothes with her. She said, wash clothes. But they had a pressing dryer. It's from that where he got his groove from. So he would bring those grooves out of where he was going with his mother to press the clothes to the dryer. So. When he had his autobiography, he talks about all about that, but he talks about my grandfather, but that's one person that I can honestly say it's because of him, my uncle, how I got in touch with O'Till, because when I went and did jam, uh, jam cruise with the uh, band called Two by Crew, all of this is full circle. Right. I was with the gentleman that's in my band, Lou Caranta, he and his band, Two by Crew, and it was on that group, that tour, I met everybody on the jam band scene. It, which opened up the door for me to make the it meet the nth power and O'Till. So it's really weird. Even that jam band scene is where I met Trumbo Shorty. The, and, and you know, it's funny. My first foray into you was in T. That was it. Yeah, yeah. It was the nth power that I must say I give honor. Matter of fact, the young man in the band was in my old band KP, who became a titan in the nth power. Mm. Courtney Smith. Everything in this band is really full circle in God. It's it really, it's, if, you, if I really was to break down, it's nothing. You can see the dots to everything in this band and everybody. And it's a true full circle moment. But it all happens with the love of what? The instrument, Jim Bay. 
If it doesn't, none of this could exist at all. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the famous Blue Note Jazz Club here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Weedy Bremer for his time. Make sure you go out and support his Grammy-nominated album, The Hands of Time, which is now available on iTunes, Amazon.com, and CD Baby. Also, I'd like to personally thank Mr. O'Teal Burbridge also for his time and his comments as well. People, I can't stress this more than enough. People like, share, and subscribe to my videos here on YouTube and Vimeo as well as leave comments. Also, please visit my website, thepatreon.com for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace.